is that this webinar is going to be recorded so watch out um that's mostly for me because i don't think you've got your cameras on and we'll um crack on shall we first of all with just a little bit of housekeeping so um many of you i can see have already um started using the public chat that's fantastic it's really nice to know uh who's here and chat is for um well chat and comments um, so that uh, we can share some ideas and continue to have a conversation, even in this slightly stilted format. Um, if you have a specific question, uh, pop it in the Q&A section, because um, my colleague Sarah is alongside me here, and she's going to be keeping an eye on that. And um, that way we can be sure that we try and respond to any specific questions. Um, I guess the important thing is that uh, this is my bread and butter. I think about this really nerdily way too much. And so if I forget to say something or I'm being really obscure, please tell me and we'll try and sort it all out. And we're going to ask you some questions, too, because this is a conversation. It's not just about us. So welcome to Deirdre and Alison and Ali and everybody. And um, today it's just me talking sadly i'm going to do that as fast as possible but going future we, we are planning four or more of these once a fortnight to explore different elements of community well-being and going forward it's not going to be me so um i might be, i'll be chairing them but actually we're going to have a whole range of guests coming to discuss stuff so um i really really hope that you're going to come to more than one because this one is just about setting the context and for those of you that don't know about uh, Devon Community Foundation we're a charity we uh, cover the whole of geographic Jev Devon so Devon, Plymouth and Torbay um, and we do three things we work with local philanthropists um, and that is just people who want to give and they want to give money time resources to local groups and organizations we use that money time and resources to support the voluntary sector and community action across the county um, we have just we're best known probably for grant making um, but that's quite an old-fashioned kind of way of thinking about it We've been around for about 24 years. In that time, we've distributed around 15 million um, across the county. And coronavirus has been very interesting because actually we have now got over half a million pounds out in the last 10 weeks. So it's, it's provided some challenges for us, but it, we've also seen the most incredible community response. Um, over and above that, we champion community well-being and communities in all shapes, sizes, places, and whatever it is they want to do. So I hope that's clear. It's just a quick overview. And um, hopefully uh, some of this will be of interest. So let's start with just a little bit of a, an explanation of what I think, what we think community well-being is all about. And community well-being is very different to individual well-being or the well-being of our sector, of that being the charitable and voluntary and community sector. Community well-being is about what are the relationships between all of these different elements. So the economy, resources, social, democracy, values, buildings, uh, you name it what are the relationships between people individuals who may be needing support or who are, or who are really doing very very well the relationships between these different elements of a, of a holistic life and the relationships then between ourselves our public bodies our businesses our voluntary sector and how much of that is kind of formal and how much is informal and what could we do our passion at Devon Community Foundation is to build thriving communities. And one of the things that we've noticed is that some communities really tick. They have what I would describe as a, a lot of social capital. And um, there's loads and loads of groups and organisations and everybody seems to know each other very well. And there's a lot of energy in that community. And some, uh, sadly, don't seem to have that. So what we're very interested in is I wonder what the difference is between those communities. And very often, one of those is an idea of um, not having permission to take action for themselves. So that might be 
you know, nice middle class communities are used to being able to say this is what we want and this is how we're going to do it. And other communities that actually haven't been empowered in that way don't feel like that. So maybe part of our job is to make sure that everybody feels empowered to take the action they want to. And maybe the lesson that we're learning from coronavirus is that actually that's now happened. That genie is out of the bottle because it really doesn't matter where you are in the county, but um some action is being taken by your community. So the idea of this introduction really is about how do we actually, um, what is the role of business in that? Because obviously businesses are there to make money and um, money then generates um, employment and it pays taxes and that does all sorts of things. We've heard for a very, very long time and I particularly have heard for a very long time about the importance of corporate social responsibility. But corporate social responsibility tends to be a little bit superficial. It's like, well, we'll just... Um, we'll sponsor something or we'll have a charity of the year. All of those things are great, but how embedded is that in the community? So here is your moment to start to participate in this. Uh, you see this quote on the right about, you know, the society has the right expectations of businesses. Um, please go ahead and um, just answer this poll. Do it quickly. I'll be really interested to see uh, where you think that quote is from. So I'm just um, going to try and see if I can see it. Polls. Oh, open polls. Hang on. Sorry. Okay, so we haven't had very many votes. Come on, is that it? The rest of you can't be bothered. Come on. At the moment, it's the Chambers of Commerce in the lead. This is like a horse race. Oh, still the Chambers of Commerce. OK, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but it would be great if you could all do it. I'd be really interested to see um, what your responses are on that. And I also would be really interested to know in chat whether you agree with that um, or whether it just feels like um, uh, it feels like a blurring of the purpose of, of uh, business in terms of profit versus a public purpose or some form of expectation. We'll come back to that point in a minute. In fact, I'll ask Sarah to tell me when we look um, when we look like we've got a result, a clear result, because at the moment it's all very um, tight. So we're going to go on to, sorry about this, I'm just trying to get the hang of the technology here. Um, so my argument would be, I guess, that um, our customers, our employees, our supply chain, our families are all deeply embedded in our own communities. And that I think increasingly over a number of years, um, our customers in particular have been interested in buying from organizations that they think are good organizations. I actually started my career with the John Lewis Partnership. Oh. I just, um, yeah, I started my career with the John Lewis Partnership. And um, that was about a partnership. We all had a stake in the business. I think it probably laid the foundations for the career that I've gone on to do because um, doing something with a purpose is important to me. I think over the years, most recently, we've seen things like, um, you know, not wanting to buy uh, clothes from sweatshops and that kind of stuff expressed by some elements of, of our society, but not all at all. So here is another poll for you. Um, what percentage of consumers prefer to purchase from purpose-driven brands? This is a piece. Okay, so here you go. Here's your um, here's your poll, and it would be really interesting to say, see what you think. Okay. 
Okay, I think we've got it. And actually, I've got the other poll now too. So interesting that on the first question, that quote, uh, the majority, quite a big majority, I think that came from the British Chambers of Commerce. Actually, that quote is taken from the CBI um, strategic document from 2019. And um, what I think is interesting about that is I think that that after the fallout from the financial crash, I think actually there was an understanding that business, there was quite a lot of business bashing and um, that really business needed to establish itself as um, not just the drivers of the economy, but also um, a, a, a positive contributor to communities and to public purpose. So in terms of the percentage of consumers, well done, very good. 7% saying 63% and that is completely right. And further to that, 62% want companies to take a stand. So where we were just talking about corporate social responsibility, what I was thinking is you can do small isolated things or perhaps you can demonstrate very clear values. And maybe the demonstrating of clear values is what in the end will make the difference. So I often use, I, I use a framework of the triple bottom line, and many of you, I'm sure, will be really familiar with this. Um, it's really about a holistic view of the business that we do. So it looks at people, profit, and planet. And of course, we all face challenges in all of those areas. With people, we have all been affected by this virus. Many of us will be dealing with pre-existing mental health issues that have become exacerbated by this. Some will have developed new mental health um, issues or anxieties. Our health, our well-being, quality of life, our social connections, our support systems, our coping mechanisms, employment, financial sustainability, education, everything has been affected for us as people. And not just us, but everybody we know as well. The reality of that is that also young people are going to be particularly affected by the um, interruption of their education and the opportunities available to them regarding employment. And that's at many, many different stages going forward. If a member of our families had been so adversely affected in that whole list of different ways, uh, individually, separate from anybody else, we would all be horrified. And um, it would be worse if they didn't have a support network of friends and family to help them out. And so I think we need to consider that very deeply when we consider how we're going to rebuild. Going back to normal in terms of the way it was before, I think is probably not realistic. And what I would hope for is a better normal. I think if we think about profit, these people who are so adversely affected, us and everybody we know, are ourselves, our staff, our customers and our suppliers. And of course, that is going to affect business profits. But businesses have to survive to generate the economic, uh, the economic benefit that's so vital to communities. So, um, and planet, don't you think it's surprising and astonishing and really quite fantastic how, um, how the environment has been changed by travel, digital, all of that sort of thing. Lovely clean air, lovely quiet for the moment. So I noticed, gosh, time is really, really ticking on. So I'm going to have to skip through a few things now. Um, So where does business fit? This teacup here is that very often people think about the community sector and community action as something very sweet and fluffy. I personally don't have the view that it's sweet and fluffy. Community organisations and community action deal with some of the most extreme um, disadvantage um, across the entire county. They deal with drug and alcohol abuse, offending, re-offending. Uh, family abuse, uh, mental health issues, homelessness. And over the last 10 weeks, they've been feeding everybody and finding their medications for them and keeping people sane and in contact with one another. 
And I really don't think that that is fluffy stuff. I think that is essential stuff for our communities. So I just need to come clear and I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'm also a non-executive director of the Heart of the Southwest Local Economic Partnership. And my role there is to champion inclusive communities. Uh, this is a recovery plan. If any of you came to David's session on this um, earlier in the week, maybe you saw it. But you'll notice that inclusive recovery is an element of that and inclusive growth is an element. And our definition of inclusivity is that everybody has an opportunity to contribute to and benefit from prosperity. Sorry, just going to move this on. Oh, gone too far. So I'm nearly at the end of this now. Um, but I would really like to ask you. Um, how might businesses do that in a non-superficial way? So businesses we know do lots and lots and lots. There are, of course, social enterprises who are mission-led and use their trading in order to generate the social benefits. And that's a whole other subject in itself, but very interesting and important. And actually, in many cases, that overlaps, particularly with family businesses. But localism is forecast to be a really major post-pandemic trend. And we are all in a place. We're all in Devon, but also we're all in, within our separate places in different places. So how do you think about supporting staff and families? How engaged is business with the local community? And does that just mean the raffle prizes? And what might clean and inclusive look like for your organisation? How, if we, if we, if if you run a community organisation, how might you open conversations with business? And if you run a business, how might you understand better what your involvement in a community might look like? So finally, we have, um, in conclusion, I don't have the answers to the questions that I've, some of the questions that I've posed today. In fact, I don't even have 55 minutes, which is apparently all that Einstein needs to work out the right questions to ask. But I will be here with guests every fortnight to explore different elements of this going forward. And I really hope that you can join us and encourage others to join us because it's not easy, this stuff. It's not, a, there isn't a simple answer. And what we're going to look at going forward is what, what happened over the last 10 weeks with community. We're going to do that by case studying what happened in Exeter. We're then going to move on a couple of weeks after that to a focus on young people and children. And then a focus after that on, you know, the impact of coronavirus on mental health and why that's important to us either as businesses or as community organisations. But the most important thing to me now, really, is to hear from you guys. So, did you want to ask anything? Do you want to say anything? I'm sorry, that's been such a scamper, but we only have half an hour and we've got 10 minutes left. If you wanted me to expand on anything, please feel free. Are you even there? It's very strange, this, because you can't see anything. There seems to be nothing on chat and nothing on Q&A. How disappointing. Oh, here we go. Sharon, ask away your questions. Alison, let's go and see what you said. Yeah, it's an interesting point that about the higher socioeconomic groups, because um, actually, of course, if you not everybody can afford to do that. But I think um, perhaps um, that might change a little bit. I think the I think e whatever your business, 
or whatever your perspective, there is no harm in demonstrating your values. So, sorry, Sharon, I can't hear you or can't see a question. So we skipped a poll, actually. And um, Sarah, I wonder if you could pop that poll up, which was... Um, which really is about whether you think your perception has changed. Yeah, here you go. So I'd be really interesting to see whether your perception has changed at all on the value of community. Okay, that's interesting. So, so people seem to see much more value than before. And certainly, I mean, I don't exactly, I don't think my view has changed, but then it's my job to um, see a lot of what goes on in community. I wonder in chat whether um, someone would like to say why they think that has happened and whether you think that will persist as we go on um, into the new, uh, as lockdown happens. Yeah, I agree with that, Alison. I don't know whether you've all seen it on chat. If you all go to chat, you can see the comments here. But Alison's saying that it would be interesting to see whether government funding looks to support the picking up the pieces. Um, it will be interesting to see that because, of course, uh, we are led to believe there is no magic money tree and we've spent a lot of money already. Yeah, value being recognised more. I agree. I would agree with that. I think also, interestingly, somebody told me who works for a very high flying advertising agency the other day that employs lots and lots of young people, young, trendy advertising types. Um, and um, she told me that her personnel department is sort of overrun by the young people going, oh, I think maybe I'd like to be a nurse or a social worker. <laughs> OK, school. Yeah, I agree. So it's not about money, is it, Mandy? It's about um, it's it's sometimes about volunteering. It's sometimes about just participating in your local community. Yeah. Yeah, trade unions have been, but it again, I mean, trade unions, um, you know, over the years, somehow their power has been eroded. And um, I think the safeguarding issue is really, really important. I think in terms of businesses, the understanding, and I run a business too, of course, it may be a charity, but I have 16 members of staff and we still have bills to pay and all of that kind of stuff. And ultimately, yeah, I think it's really important that we, Maybe what's happened is that, ironically, distancing has brought us closer in terms of understanding one another, having more of a view of each other and our family lives than we had before. Yeah, mutual. I, I, sorry, Simon, that's a really interesting point about mutual aid. With mutual aid, uh, and that is one of our biggest challenges as a funder, is that actually traditionally what we've always done is put money into um, sort of at least partially formalised groups and organisations. But actually, I think the the urge to help in terms of mutual aid and informality, and we would really want to support that, but that's very difficult to do. Any more for any more? So we only have a few minutes left now. And what I was hoping that we might do is um, discuss whether or you could express an interest in whether you want to come to these in the future, uh, whether you may be able to um, talk about that. Local banking is really important. Good point, Alison. Um, because I think debt management is likely to be very difficult. Who needs to change, Simon?
Is that from a funding point of view that we need to be able to do that? Yeah, I've been watching the development of the Southwest Mutual Bank um, with a lot of interest, and I think new financial models, both for funders in terms of supporting mutual aid and um, in terms of banking in supporting individuals, um, I think are likely to be really important. Anyway, we've run out of time. I can't believe it. It's gone in a flash. And um, I'm really sorry that I didn't actually have a chance to expand on too much of it. But as I say, we're planning a series of these. It would be fantastic if you felt you could come. I'm very grateful for your time today. It's incredibly helpful for me to um, to hear views and to be able to express it. We don't want to work in a vacuum. We all want to work together. Uh, maybe you could encourage others to come along or and or if you want to pick up anything going forward, please get in touch with us at Devon Community Foundation. There will be a lot more work happening via the House of the Southwest LEP around um, inclusive growth, around how we use funds to support the most vulnerable in the context of economic development. And from Devon Community Foundation's point of view, there'll be a, a lot happening around the recovery phase and how we support our communities to thrive. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming along. And hopefully I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs>